In this A-level chemistry revision video, we're going to look at back titration. Now, back titration is not specifically named within the A-level specification, but you do often encounter questions that come within the kind of overall titration umbrella. And I think a lot of people get confused conceptually about what's going on in back titration, and that makes the calculations that much harder. So we're going to look at this now. So before we talk specifically about back titration, let's just briefly talk about titration. Remember, I have made a video for the required practical one where you make up a standard solution and then titrate with it, and also a separate video for just regular vanilla titration calculations. So in titration, we're using one substance which we do know the concentration of to work out the concentration of a second substance. So in this example here, I'm going to use a volumetric pipette to suck up 25 centimetres cubed of some acid, and that acid has an unknown concentration. And I put that acid into a conical flask. And the reason I use a conical flask is because when I'm swirling it to homogenise the solution, that's going to prevent any from splashing out, which would be dangerous and also would influence my results. That conical flask is placed on a white tile to make the colour change obvious, and speaking of a colour change, I need to add some indicator, like this phenolphthalein here. And in year 13, in the acids and bases topic, um, you talk about different indicators, and the fact that we want an indicator that's going to have a really clear, precise colour change to indicate where the end point is. So you'd never use universal indicator for this, because you'd be saying, well, how do I know when it's neutral? Which exact shade of green is right? So then once I've added that indicator, I can start titrating. And in my burette, I've got some sodium hydroxide or another alkali that I know the concentration of. So by the time that I've finished my titration, because I add it until, um, until I see my first permanent colour change, by the time I've finished that titration, I have two pieces of information about the reagent that was in the burette. I know its concentration because I knew that before I started, and I know its volume because I can read that off my burette by looking at the meniscus. So then, based on this, I can do a calculation to work out what the concentration of the acid was, even though at the start I only knew its volume. So I can use the chemical equation of the neutralisation reaction between the alkali and the acid to work out the ratio of moles. So let's say that in this example, it takes 40 centimetres cubed of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide to neutralise my conical flask of sulfuric acid. Now the first thing that you always want to be doing in any of these quantitative questions is to work out the moles of something. There will be one of the reagents that you have two pieces of information for, either the mass and an MR or a concentration and a volume, and that will allow you to work out moles. So looking at this particular question, I only know one thing about the sulfuric acid, but I have two pieces of information about the sodium hydroxide, and that will allow me to calculate the moles. So by rearranging concentration is moles divided by volume, I get moles is concentration times volume, and it's obviously important that that volume is in decimeters cubed. So I'm going to need to convert 40 centimeters cubed by dividing it by 1,000. So if I do that calculation, I can work out my moles of sodium hydroxide. Now I need to know the moles of sulfuric acid in order to be able to work out the concentration. And for that, I'm going to need a chemical symbol equation. Now, if you're not given this in the question, you're going to need to work it out and balance it yourself. And the thing to be aware of with a simple acid alkali titration is that you're going to need equal numbers of hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions. So because the sulfuric acid has two hydrogen ions and the sodium hydroxide only has one hydroxide ion, you're going to need twice as much sodium hydroxide as sulfuric acid in terms of moles. So if I've got 0.004 moles of sodium hydroxide, I'm going to have half that amount of moles of sulfuric acid, which would be 0.0020. And now that I have moles and the volume, which I already had at the start, I can work out that the concentration of, of um, sulfuric acid will be 0.0020 divided by that volume converted to decimeters cubed, and that gives me a concentration of 0.08 moles per decimeter cubed. Now, if you are doing a little common sense check at this point, you might pause and go, hang on a second, how can the sulfuric acid be less concentrated than the sodium hydroxide when it was a smaller volume? But remember, as we've just said, the sulfuric acid has twice as many hydrogen ions in it. So if you were thinking of the concentration of the hydrogen ions rather than the sulfuric acid, we need to double that back up. And so then you can sort of see it makes a little bit more sense. So that's how we do the calculations for basic vanilla titration. That works fine if we're trying to work out what the concentration of a solution is. 
but sometimes we're trying to analyse a solid, like this piece of rock here. Imagine it's some limestone, which is mainly calcium carbonate, and I want to know exactly how much calcium carbonate there is in it. I can't just do a titration with a piece of rock, so I need a different approach. Here I've got a beaker which contains an excess of acid, and the crucial thing is that this time around I actually know what the concentration of that acid is. I'm going to know the volume and the concentration of both of the liquids that I'm using in this titration. So I take my acid and I put my calcium carbonate into it, and I'm going to wait until it's reacted as much as it's going to. At this point I'm going to use that acid, that sort of leftover acid, to do the titration. So again, I take my pipette, I put it in a conical flask, white tile, indicator, titrate it with some sodium hydroxide, wait for the first permanent colour change, and at this point I'm going to take the volume from the burette, measuring from the meniscus, same as I always would. The crucial thing here is that by using the titration with the sodium hydroxide, I can work out how many moles of hydrochloric acid there actually are in the conical flask. How many were there left to do that titration? But because I knew what the concentration was at the start, I can also work out how many moles I started with. And the difference between those two number of moles will be how much of the acid reacted with my rock. And so I can use that to work out the percentage purity. So here's a slightly simplified example of a typical exam question involving back titration. We've got a sample of a rock and we believe it to be calcium carbonate and it's going to react with a sample of acid. Then the residual acid, the leftover acid that hasn't reacted with the rock is used to do a titration and we want to know what the percentage purity of the calcium carbonate was. These questions aren't super complicated but they do have a lot of steps so it's going to take me a lot of the screen to answer it so I've just summarised the key numbers from the question down at the bottom of the screen. The first step is to work out how many moles of sodium hydroxide have been used, just like we would have done in a regular titration. So in this instance, it was one mole of sodium hydroxide and it took 20 centimetres cubed, so that gives me 0.02 moles. Now I'm going to use the symbol equation to work out how many moles of hydrochloric acid took part in the titration. So in this instance, they're reacting in a one-to-one -one ratio, and therefore if I have 0.02 moles of sodium hydroxide, I also have 0.02 moles of hydrochloric acid. My next step is to think about how much acid should there have been. Let's say that instead of putting calcium carbonate in the acid before the titration, I just put something completely inert that didn't react. Well, in that case, how much hydrochloric acid would I have been expecting there to be by the time I started the titration? So again, I can do moles by working out concentration times volume, and I started out with one mole of hydrochloric acid, and there was 25 centimetres cubed, so that would be 0.025 moles. Now, the difference between that and the number I just worked out from the titration, that's going to tell me how much reacted with my carbonate. So in step two, we said that there was 0.020 moles of hydrochloric acid taking part in the titration, but at the very start of the question, we had 0.025 moles. So that means that 0.05 moles has gone somewhere, and the only place it can have gone is that it's reacted with the calcium carbonate. I can use this information, together with the symbol equation, to work out how many moles of calcium carbonate have reacted. So as you can see from the symbol equation, for every two moles of hydrochloric acid, I only need one of calcium carbonate. I'm halving the number of moles. So that means that 0.025 moles of calcium carbonate reacted with the hydrochloric acid. That's how many moles there were in my sample of rock. Now to work out the percentage purity of this, I need to know how many moles would I have if that rock was 100% pure calcium carbonate. So the first thing I need to do is work out the relative formula mass. And this is going to be 100.1 grams per mole. Then I can use masses Mr. Mole to work out how many moles there should be in four grams of calcium carbonate. So that's 0 0.040 moles. If I take the number of moles of calcium carbonate that reacted with the acid, which is shown in white, and I divide it by the expected number of moles if that substance was absolutely pure calcium carbonate, shown in this creamy yellow colour, and I divide the first by the second and then multiply by 100 to make it a percentage, I get a percentage purity of 62.5%.
Here's another very similar question so that you can pause the video and see whether you can work through this on your own. On the right hand side of the screen I've listed the seven steps that I went through. So pause the video now. So the first step that we needed to do in order to answer this question was to work out the moles of the reagent in the burette, which in this instance was sodium hydroxide. So I do this by multiplying the concentration by the volume, which gives me a total of 0.015 moles. My second step was to work out how many moles of hydrochloric acid reacted. And as we've already said, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid react in a one-to-one -one ratio. So this is really easy, it's just going to be the same number of moles. My third step is to work out how many moles of hydrochloric acid should there be if there just hadn't been any reaction with the carbonate to begin with. So here I'm going to use the concentration and the volume of hydrochloric acid. So concentration times volume gives me 0.025 moles. My fourth step is to work out the difference between these values because that will tell me how much reacted with my carbonate at the start. So that's 0.010 moles. Step number five is to use another simple equation to work out how many moles of calcium carbonate actually were there reacting with the acid. So again, we can see that carbonates, group two carbonates and hydrochloric acid react in a one to two ratio. So I'm going to need to half my moles and that gives me 0.005. Then I want to know how much calcium carbonate would there have been if it was 100% pure. And we do this using the MR of calcium carbonate, which we already worked out. And that's going to be 0.04 moles. So finally, we can calculate the purity from those two numbers. 0.005 divided by 0.04 gives me a purity of 12.5% once I've converted it to a percentage. Hopefully you managed that okay. Now there's one more tiny step that we need to add to our practical and it's going to make very little difference to your calculation but people often forget it. It's not going to be possible for us to pour 25 centimetres cubed of acid into a beaker and then get 25 centimetres cubed of acid out of the beaker. For one thing the rock is porous and it's going to absorb some but also just you're going to have some adhering to the sides of the beaker and it's just not going to be possible. So what we do instead is we add a larger volume of our acid at the start and then we take a small sample of that to do the titration and then we just take that into account when we do the calculation. So here I've got 250 centimetres cubed of acid rather than just 25 and again my calcium carbonate goes in but I then only take out 25 centimetres cubed and then I carry on and do the rest of my titration. So here's another question that takes this into account. If you're feeling confident, you might want to pause here and see if you can work through it yourself, but I will talk you through it. So we start out by working out moles of sodium hydroxide. So this time we've got 18 centimetres cubed and 0.5 molar. So that's going to give us 0.009 moles. Again, we use the same equation, same one-to-one -one ratio. The number of moles of hydrochloric acid is the same. Then we think about how much hydrochloric acid there should be just in that 25 centimetres cubed that we did the titration with. So this should be 0.025 moles. Then I look at the difference. I work out how much of the hydrochloric acid actually has gone off and reacted with the carbonate instead of being around for the titration. So that's 0.016 moles. Now, here's the additional step. We need to consider the full 250 centimetres cubed. So we need to take that 0.016 moles that, was, um, that should have been in the 25 centimetres cubed for the titration and wasn't, and multiply it by 10 to take account of the fact that our original volume of acid was 250, not 25. So that's obviously 0.160 moles. Now we just carry on as before. So in this question, we've got magnesium carbonate, but it's still reacting in a one to two ratio with the acid. And so again, I'm going to divide my number of moles by two to give me 0.080 moles. Now I need to know how much magnesium carbonate there is in 10 grams if it was absolutely pure. So I'm going to need to work out the MR again because this time we're using a different carbonate. So I do that and I come up with 84.3. And so therefore the number of moles that we're expecting is 0.1186. So therefore, 
if I actually had 0 0.080 moles reacting, but I expected 0.1186 moles to react, that gives me a percentage purity of 67.4%. Here's one final question for you to have a go at if you didn't do the previous one. So this time we've got copper carbonate, um, and other than that, it's all gonna be the same process, just with slightly different numbers. So pause the video and check that you can do this calculation. Just like before, we start out by working out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide that have come from the burette. Then we use the fact that we know that hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide react in a one-to-one -one ratio to say that in the titration, there were the same number of moles of hydrochloric acid. Then we think about our conical flask and say how many moles of hydrochloric acid would there have been in there if there had been no reaction with the carbonate at all. So that's gonna be 0.0125 moles. The difference between those represents moles that reacted with the carbonate and therefore never made it to the titration. That's just for 25 centimetres cubed, so we need to multiply by 10 to work out how many moles there were in the original 250 centimetres cubed of acid that we added to our full sample of carbonate. Since we know that copper carbonate is going to react in a 1 to 2 ratio with hydrochloric acid, we need to half that to get the number of moles of copper carbonate. And then we can use the MR of copper carbonate to work out how many moles we would expect in eight grams of rock. And then finally, we can use that number to work out the percentage purity, which is 90.3. Thank you very much for watching. And I hope that you found that a useful introduction to back titration and the associated calculations. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry videos coming soon.